Good morning and welcome to Tech Week TV brought to you by Callahan Innovation. My name is Jake Miller. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Unfiltered and we're delighted to have you all here today watching this session. Today's session is on angel investment and venture capital. What does the future hold? Uh, I'm joined by some very impressive people today, uh, several of whom, who, whom I know from, uh, from other, uh, other sort of areas of life. So we have Arnold Reedy, he's a partner at PwC. We have Mike Bignall, also a partner at PwC. Uh, Phil McCaw, he's the founding partner of Movac, uh, and Robbie Paul, the CEO of Ice House Ventures. So it's going to be a fascinating conversation today, and please submit your questions online as we go, uh, and then we will ask some audience questions once, once we get into things. So to kick this off, gentlemen, um, I'd love to hear from you all as to like why you're passionate about this space, not so much what you do, but why you, know, you get up every morning to help you know, grow the technology scene in New Zealand, help startups grow, and why this is something you've decided to dedicate your life to. So maybe starting with you, Robbie. Thanks. Uh, well, gosh, uh, I'd say my passion just comes from the passion of the founders that we um, support and invest in, right? I, I get immense pleasure thinking that there's hundreds of founders out there that are determined to solve a big problem, win on a global stage, and I'm just happy to support that in a small way. Absolutely, yeah. Phil. Yeah, I guess, well, our, our vision um, going back sort of 20 years has been to, to, to try to be a catalyst for change in the New Zealand economy. So. Um, we always saw a huge opportunity to grow jobs and wealth for New Zealanders um, through through technology and um, create the next set of jobs for our children um, and, and future generations. So that's that's kind of what keeps us driving yeah. driving forward and keeps us grounded and coming back to work every day. Sure. Yeah. What about you, Alice? Yeah, I agree with what Robbie and Phil said. I guess at a personal level, I think the energy of uh, dealing with founders, the passion, um, riding the ups and lows with them as an advisor is uh, really engaging and um, gives you, I guess, a sense of purpose as well around uh, how we can help those businesses contribute to New Zealand and, and yeah, grow jobs and wealth as well for the country. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And for me, I just love it when people want to take on the world, you know, and that's what you do with a startup. Big idea, big opportunity and just going for it, and that's what I love. Yeah, and how, how has the landscape changed in the past 10 years? Because there's been so many great examples of companies like Xero and Pushpay and Vend and, you know, these, these companies that are truly going global and creating waves all around the world. How has that influenced, inspired, impacted the way other entrepreneurs are thinking and thinking about truly scaling a company globally from day one? Feel free to just jump in any time. Maybe start with you, Arnold. Uh, I guess one observation I'd have is, um, particularly with our clients, in the last probably four or five years, we've seen uh, people that have exited out of other investments, um, which is in the media, I guess that's sometimes an issue, um, you know, why did they sell? There's sort of, you know, sometimes there's a bit of a negative put on it, but from what we see with our clients, it's, it's very much in the positive in terms of people that have built a company, uh, particularly international, that, that's not easy to do from New Zealand. So yes. people that have come back with uh, some smarts, some money behind them, um, and usually then redeploying that back into the ecosystem, that's wholly positive. And I think that's a trend that's emerging, particularly around companies that uh, successfully raise capital. And Phil, we might have some thoughts on this as well. Quite often the expertise of founders that have ridden that journey with all the war stories that they've got and have come back and can build another business behind that with some capital and international connections is a very positive uh, trend that's emerging probably in the last five, six, seven years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think the industry's changed massively. Um, we go back sort of 15, 20 years, um, and when we exited out of Trade Me, we, we started looking around for software businesses to invest in. Our thesis was we're going to invest in software businesses in Wellington. Um, six months later, we said we are invest in software businesses in New Zealand. Another six months later, we said we'd invest in technology um, across New Zealand. And we went from software investors to investors in biotech startups and wireless power companies. Um, so I, I think when you think about the, just the volume of startups and creativity and the deepness and richness that's coming out now, it is, it is fundamentally different. We've got repeat, uh, repeat offenders in terms of founders and teams now. And we've got clusters of technology starting to emerge, obviously around Xero, around Trade Me, around Pushpay. Then you've got all the stuff that's happened out of Lanza Tech. Yes. Um, yeah. um, we're seeing biotech clusters emerge. So it's a pretty exciting time to be an investor at the moment. For sure, yeah. yeah. And obviously there's no right way to do this because you see companies like Xero that have been based here in New Zealand as their head office from, from day one. And still today, my understanding is then other companies like Pushpay is another example, but they did it a different way and went over to Seattle relatively early in the journey. Is, is New Zealand a good place to 
scale one of these companies from? Like if you were investing for or through ISAS Ventures, would you advise your founders to get, get into a bigger market as early as possible? Or do you think New Zealand's a good place to do it from? Does that mean? first. Look, entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs, right? They'll go wherever they can go, where they're best treated, where they can get the most resources to solve the problems that they, um, that they want to solve. So it, I, I don't think we can prescribe to an entrepreneur to stick it to one spot or, or, uh, or one method. That's why they're entrepreneurs, yeah. right? So uh, the good news is that there's a heck of a lot of support out of New Zealand. Uh, and increasingly, there's high pedigree people around that can help them and founders that have sold businesses before um, and Movac raising more money, so there's yeah. a um, there's a lot of um, a lot of good stuff happening. But we can't tell an entrepreneur um, what to do. That's it's why a, they're an entrepreneur. That's a fair point. And, and and talking about the support and the ecosystem, one thing that uh, congratulations with your recent uh, announcement with Ice House Ventures. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and what you guys do, just to give people a bit of context on on your background? So yeah, Ice House Ventures is the investment arm of the Ice House. We're picking up what we've been doing for the last 18 years and um, investing uh, more aggressively over um, over the future um, with more support from uh, partners, Simplicity, First and Zed, and, and Sir Stephen Tyndall, and a few private investors. Uh, we are a group of uh, investment entities. Originally, it was Ice Angels. Then we uh, added Tahua Ventures, which now has uh, 30 million under management. And then we've added Eden Ventures, Flux Accelerator, Archangels, and a, a variety of other uh, platforms. So uh, all we want to do is come together and invest together in the highest quality Kiwi companies. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, what, you talk to, uh, I'd love to know a little bit more about the announcement recently over the past few weeks. Yeah, so essentially we're just uh, walking the talk. We, we tell founders to um, surround themselves with good people, to uh, better articulate their vision, to um, invest in their... Um, in their objectives, um, and often you do that by raising capital. And when you go through a capital raising process for your entity, I think you just come out better having gone through the process because yes. you've got to articulate what you want to do and you've got to think bigger. That's so, true. so that's what we did. Um, we went to some strategic investors and now we've brought on some really great people. And um, even if we hadn't raised that $4 million, I think we'd be better off um, having gone through the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in terms of these investments you're making, is it quite industry agnostic or are there certain areas you're focused on? Oh, look, we invest in everything from uh, regrowing human skin to extracting gold from e-waste to um, solid shampoo right. uh, to sparkling wine. So okay. uh, we like to say we're uh, anywhere at the intersection of high quality people and big opportunities. Okay. Um, and we'll go for it. Yeah, yeah. And Phil, uh, with Movac, I'd love to know, you mentioned sort of why you're in the space, why you're passionate about it, but I'd love to know more about your investment thesis, um, you know, specifically what type of companies you're looking to invest in. So we're investing our fourth fund at the moment, Jake, which is a $110 million growth fund. Um, it's an important word, growth, I guess, in the context of that fund. So we're really looking to, to pick up where Ice Angels might leave off or have gone as, sort of as far as they can. So... Um, that fund, we're, we're really looking for um, companies and opportunities that have proven that they've got product market fit, so they've got products in market, revenues are flowing from those products, and our um, capital is going to scale those businesses. Yes. Um, you know, alongside that, critically is, is team. These are these are always um, long-term investments for us, and so the relationship is very pivotal for us in terms of the relationships we have with the founders, the other board directors, mm -hmm. and the execs and the team, um, and, and obviously also making sure that that exec team starting to come together in a form that we have some confidence that they can execute on their strategy. Right. What does a good team or a good founding team look like? Because obviously, COVID, you know, uh, breakup. <laughs> and founder relationships can be one of the main things yeah. that destroy companies. What are the yeah. warning signs or conversely the, the positive things that you're looking for? Well, we're looking for a broad mix um, um, across kind of the bench, I guess, in terms of being able to go to market from a sales and marketing point of view, being able to build out the products and continue to innovate with the products and the technologies. Um, obviously being able to run the finances um, yeah. and run the run the recruitment side of the business, the HR side of the business. So, you know, talent is a real issue for New Zealand companies now, scaling talent. Yes. So um, making sure that we're we're confident that they're going to be able to do all of that. So it has to be a has to be a complete package. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, and yeah. maybe um, PwC. I know you you obviously have so many amazing insights around talent mm -hmm. and uh, you know business in general. In, in terms of attracting uh, talent to New Zealand, what more can we be doing to get the right people here to actually scale these companies? Because it seems like there's so many so many incredible companies that are being founded by so many smart people. But it, is, is the talent here to actually build them, yeah, and the where talent, can we get the, that? The talent is definitely here, Jake. And I, and I think the important thing is that talent goes to where there's vision and purpose. Yeah. 
And the greatest thing that you have with um, early stage businesses is they're built off purpose and vision. Yeah. Um, you just got to make sure there's alignment. Yeah. And I think one of the, the key things is that as these businesses go through their different stages, sometimes how they go about that purpose and that vision needs to change. And I think one of the difficult things which often happens is how do you keep evolving the people within that organisation, mm. even though it might be small, wanting to be bigger, wanting to be great and big, um, to make sure that you align along the way with what the talent is needed to be. Yeah, yeah. And, and the ones that do it well, uh, are the ones that carry on on that trajectory. Yeah. And it can be quite hard for founders and, and others to sort of keep evolving who's around them. And, and I suppose in the big picture too, you know, there's lots of talk about diversity and inclusion. That is very, very true in yeah. growth-based businesses because yeah. it's that diversity of thought which really drives, you know, challenging the norm to actually create a, big, a bigger opportunity. Mm. And to, to do a bit of a, a sales pitch for you guys as such, I, I, I've been working with PwC for a number of years now, and I think when I first started working with you as a, as a young entrepreneur, you know, the perception of any of the big four is, you know, these big companies that don't have time for little startups and, you know, they're only looking to a big audit accounts and so on, but um, that just wasn't true and something that I learned not to be true. So how do you work with startups and what would you say to entrepreneurs watching this that might hear PwC and be like, too expensive, too big for us? You know, I'll have a go at that one. Um, <laughs> yes, it's probably what we notice is uh, a lot of the startups have a range of complexity in terms of the types of business problems they have and sometimes they'll be assisted by uh, their investors, independent directors. Um, but then there's probably a, a wheelhouse of things that are largely connected to raising capital. So some of it will be managing um, investor expectations around are we reporting the right things to our investors, so the right metrics. So there's a bit of a design piece there to help the founders um, you know, communicate well with the shareholders and potentially other investors. Um, probably the other area that we help our clients with a lot is on the international side. So in New Zealand, uh, you see companies uh, dabbling overseas very early, so the market here is quite small. Um, but in areas like SaaS or biotech or other things like that, the foreign yeah. markets come calling quite quickly. Um, and yeah, there's just a, some advice and assistance required to sometimes handle those issues the right way. Um, and, and really, I guess our main sort of discussion with uh, founders is um, you know, you're not an audited company necessarily, you may not be a listed company, um, but let's just focus on getting some of the um, compliance in order and making sure that none of the issues that you're dealing with at that really early stage where it can be, you know, a real focus, cash is, you know, a big issue mm. for startups, um, but sometimes there's little things that uh, you need help with, like how do we set up in the United States or, yeah. you know, we're raising capital, you know, some, what do we need around the shareholders agreement, all yeah. those sorts of things. That can be highly problematic um, in the later stage. Yeah. Probably the other one um, that we do have a lot of discussions with, and, and you guys probably see this as well, is just having a conversation with founders about how to manage their cap table and what dilution might look like in two, three years. And we've had quite a few um, clients of ours that have had great businesses, good products, great founders, doing well overseas, but they sometimes get into a bit of a trap later on where... Um, particularly the you know small group of founders or a founder is too heavily diluted at the beginning. So mm. sometimes it's just opening up the founders' um, eyes to the conversations that they may be facing in two years, three years sort of time. Yeah, and there's no doubt that global network can be powerful. This is quite a tactical question, but uh, even like the, the PwC stamp on a set of accounts when you're raising capital can be quite powerful, right? Yeah, I mean, I think what we try to do, it's probably going to hand over to Phil because he's talked to me about this topic as well, <laughs> is um, we need to sort of run a little bit of a balancing act to support our startups, yes, but also don't make the situation confusing for potential investors. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we have to um, help them, and largely we try to be in the background in areas that where we have the right expertise. But at the end of the day, particularly for sta startups, um, when it comes to raising capital, running their team, mm. talking to customers. Um, it's very much a, a founder-led operation at that stage. So exactly. we, we want to support the founders, it's our focus, yeah. but we don't want to make it confusing for others as to our role versus the founders. Exactly. So let, let's talk more about that process now, obviously the key purpose of the session. Like what, what would you say is all of your advice for entrepreneurs preparing to raise money, particularly at that seed stage, uh, you know, and then, and then maybe later rounds as well, particularly with Movac, like what are the preparations they should be doing? What should they be thinking about? What are investors looking for? Um, you know, so of your well, first, don't reinvent the wheel, right? I mean, you're following in the footsteps of 50-plus companies each year that have raised money, and most of them are very open with the process they went through, the you know, challenges they had around valuation, the um, negotiation points that were sensitive. 
Um, and you, you take that, which is just following other people's uh, footsteps, and, and second, you take templates and guides and examples that are uh, readily available and you're pretty well equipped. Then uh, you have to do the heavy lifting around uh, articulating your vision and being very clear with uh, what you're asking for. And um, that you can't ask, you know, you can't sort of outsource. Yes. That's, that's your business. Uh, but, the, you know, I, I can't remember who said it, but they said, you know, innovate on your business. Don't get creative on everything else, yeah. right? Yeah. The, the, there's yeah. enough risk there. So. That's a good quote. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. What do you see, Phil? Uh, build a great business and don't raise capital. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, look, uh, but facetious, you know, certain businesses obviously do need to raise capital, yes. but I think fundamentally focus on building a great business uh, and then, then money will flow. Um, and there's nothing that screams invest in a company uh, more than traction. Mm. Um, mm. And you, you only get so many shots at selling hope. Yeah. Um, and we, we see repeat offenders in New Zealand selling hope and, and you know, uh, bless me, I'm, I've, I've got a few of those um, yeah. and, I'm, and I'm active in a few of those. But, yeah. um, you know, the more momentum you have in terms of how you're, how you're going to market is, is coming together, yes. then, then the rest will flow. Uh, I could add a whole bunch of other stuff No, that's great it, advice. But that's, that's, uh, that's the fundamental. You know, when you're in the early stages, obviously, uh, often if you're a early stage founder without a track record, uh, you know, the conventional wisdom is kind of take any money you can get as such if you're trying to raise. But uh, what you often find is that the quality of your investors is really important and later on you can end up in an unhappy marriage with people that potentially aren't the best people for your company. What's all of your advice around maybe starting with you, Mike, around getting the right people on board and what should people be looking for in those seed stage, seed stage investors? Yeah, I think it's like most things. You've got to have a plan. You don't, you don't want to have a fixed plan because things can change over time. But I think you need to know what's going to help you get to where you need to get to next. And I think if you focus a couple of steps forward but very clearly on what the next step is and what those milestones are going to be and surround yourself with the people that are going to help you get to there but actually be able to move beyond that, um, that's the most helpful thing. Um, you've got to be very careful not to, not to take the first, um, the first opportunity. And, and sort of once you get that in your mindset and you've got that clear path, I think t things tend to just sort of um, turn out right. And as Phil says, you know, if you build a good business first, you know, the other things will just fit alongside that and it'll become quite clear as to who fits and who doesn't. Absolutely. You know, anything uh, just adding to that, um, uh, probably an old wise head once <laughs> told me that uh, taking on a shareholder is like getting married in some respects. So, um, it's, you know, yes, the cash can be... Uh, nice to have on uh, in the business, but um, one thing that's very difficult to do is uh, deal with a problematic shareholding relationship. So, mm. with divorce, there's probably a legal framework for you know people to separate in that sense. But uh, in a corporate situation, it can be very messy if you've got um, shareholders on board that aren't aligned with other shareholders, with the board, with the founders, mm. um, and it can be high, highly problematic to deal with that situation. So, I guess the message for founders would be. You know, treat it as quite a serious relationship. Yeah, yeah due diligence people. both ways, right? Correct. Yeah, you, you need to take care on, particularly in that early stage, um, and really understand why are they investing in the company and how are you going to meet their expectations. And sometimes if that's not clear, it can be quite a difficult relationship going yeah. forward. Yeah, and at, at the later stage, Phil, like if you are, if you do have one of those situations and you're trying to do, um, for want of a better word, from an entrepreneur's perspective, a bit of a clear out, what's the best way to approach those conversations? Uh, directly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, the, the nice thing about capital raising, if there's money on the table, it, it creates a moment mm. that you have an opportunity to address a few issues, whether it's um, getting the founder's equity right on the cap table because it's been too diluted, yep. um, whether it's getting, uh, whether there's a few shareholders that um, perhaps need to be exited at that stage. And, the, the, you know, the nice thing is that we can we can bring some capital to the table to help with that. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So just, I'm conscious of time, we have about five minutes left. I just wanted to get all of your perspectives on what the government is doing and should be doing and could be doing more of. Obviously, we, we have vehicles like the New Zealand Venture Investment Fund. I'm just keen to hear, keen to hear everybody's sort of what they think of the effectiveness of that strategy and, and, and your advice to the government on what they could be doing more. Well, we'll go before Phil does. He might have, he might have five minutes worth of advice. No, just, just there you Look, I, I think that um, you know, the, government, the government plays a big part in the ecosystem. You know, there's a lot of government organisations which support um, you know, the innovative side and the growth side of businesses. Um, capital is one of those, and the New Zealand VIF has been a big part of that. Um, like anything, it needs to continue to evolve. It needs to ensure that um, its purpose is aligned with what the ecosystem needs. And, and look, there's, 
lots of people for a long period of time have talked about the sort of the the additional follow-on capital that's required after angel and seed, and if the right structures can be put in place where where they have funds which can be put into that alongside other investors, well, that seems to me to be a good idea. Yeah. And we may soon find out over the next couple of weeks. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's that's kind of my view as well. I think um, I've, I guess I've been involved with NZVIF for, for 15 odd, odd years. Um, we we saw the creation of the SCIF. Um, the SCIF program, which I think has been hugely instrumental in helping support and build out the angel community in New Zealand. Um, I think jury's out as to whether that needs to continue. We've got a really thriving ecosystem at that level now. Um, I think that you know the lens for me needs to turn back to kind of making sure that we've got enough venture funds to really be able to support New Zealand businesses going mm. forward. We've got good inbound interest from offshore at the moment, um, but that's just a fact that we've seen that come and go over 15 yeah. years, and it, it's a bit of a factor of the global economy at the moment. Yeah, um, that could blow up, and in, 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 in literally a couple of months of this China tariff war really takes yeah. hold. So. I think that we need a really strong New Zealand industry, and I think um, at the moment, you know, I say this regrettably, but government's still got a role to play in that. Yeah, and, and I mean, you're, when you say we need, um, you know, more of these venture funds to fund these companies, particularly at later stages, I mean, yeah. it's very true. And one of the things, though, is that there's no shortage of money here. Like, there's a lot of there's a lot of rich people with deep pockets and a lot of cash. Um, how do we get them to put it into these areas? I think probably some of the um, rules around the way the broader sort of capital markets work in New Zealand. So, for example, um, there's a lot of discussion about KiwiSaver and whether there should be some uh, relaxing of rules to allow asset allocation into high risk. But I think if it was, it wouldn't be just targeted to you know, tech and startups and things. It would be, to, like, say, in the United States, um, their 401k, which is sort of a contributory uh, pension scheme, and you can pick where you want to put it. And that can go into property. It can go to all sorts of things. So yep. I guess... Um, some relaxation to allow some, you know, more of that larger scale capital yeah. to follow into risk investments would be worth looking at. I yeah. mean, KiwiSaver is relatively new in New Zealand, yeah. so, you know, we're not there yet, but I imagine yeah. those sorts of topics are exactly. being looked at. And thank God the capital gains tax will shut down, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so just exactly finally... For the next 25 minutes. Um, last, que <laughs> last, last question. Um, <laughs> last question, uh, conscious of time, I'd love all your perspective. This is less so on raising money, more so on uh, the opportunities. Like, what, what is the... Where do you... If you're, where do you think are the greatest opportunities today for smart entrepreneurs to be creating value? Obviously, there's hundreds of industries, but what's an area that you're looking at personally, all of you individually, that you go, wow, this is underserved? Or, you know, in a couple of words, like, where would you be, where would you be starting if you're an entrepreneur today? Well, personally, I, I, I would start by just um, something that you are passionate about. I, I don't think you can condense it into one particular place. The world moves too quickly. If you're going to be successful, you've got to be believing in what you're doing, and you've got to, and you've got to find out where the market's big enough for your belief to thrive. Yeah, yeah. Great answer, yeah. What about you, Anand? As an observation, and you know, again, just seeing some of our clients are doing particularly well, I think New Zealand has some strengths compared to other countries. So you know, agriculture and related uh, industries is one where we're doing really well. I think um, something that's coming up um, in the next, what is it, next election really, I think the, what happens with the referendum on legalisation or whatever it might be of marijuana mm. um, in other industries, I mean, that, that's... That could be an opportunity for New Zealand. We've got a thriving industry right here in Northland, um, <laughs> those fields. But I think there will be some uh, redeployment of you know, some of New Zealand's skills in production on the agricultural side, which may be, um, you know, which may be in different directions shortly. Great, thank you. Yeah, for me, I'm going to turn up my personal, I guess, interest and focus on environmental impact. Yeah. Um, I think that the, you know, there's a, a whole generation of, of, of kids that are growing up in a world that um, we've kind of stuffed up. Um, we need to do something about that. So I'm going to turn my attention to that. And I think that that's going to present um, some really interesting opportunities, not because I've turned my attention to it, but no, um, yeah. just because there's uh, so much energy starting to evolve. And I think the opportunity there is how can we use capital markets to yeah. really direct capital to, to high impact ventures that you know uh, are going to do do good in this world. Yeah, I was reading Bloomberg this morning, and 2018 was the fifth year in a row that over 300 million dollars globally was invested in clean tech. So it's go. a hot, hot area. Yeah, yeah finally. I, I think Phil's answer is really great. Actually, it's, yeah. uh, we were at an angel conference last year, and everybody was listening to Sean Simpson tell the story of Lands Attack. You guys remember, mm. remember that? And yeah. uh, 
everybody was sort of leaning in like, wow, yeah. you've made it, you're huge. And then he did a right turn and reminded everybody that not only is it a big, uh, potentially profitable business, yeah. it's solving a big problem for the world. And yeah. so more of those would be great. He's an impressive guy for sure. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for putting your time aside and being with us this morning. And uh, thank you all very much to the viewers for watching, to uh, Callahan Innovation. Um, I know we've got an iPad here with questions uh, that you can all submit. I had a few issues with the technology, which is ironic for Tech Week, but that is uh, <laughs> probably my own stupidity. So do continue to submit your questions. In the next sessions, I'll make sure I get to some of them. And we look forward to seeing you back here soon. Thank you for watching.